everybody. Welcome back to What on Earth Am I Here For? Now, so far in this series, we have looked at God's first two purposes for your life. You were planned for God's pleasure, that's worship, and you were formed for God's family, that's the purpose of fellowship. Now, God wants you to know and love him, and he wants you to know and love and be a part of his family. Now we come to this session where we look at God's third purpose for your life, and it's this. You were created to become like Christ. This is a good one. This is the purpose of discipleship. God doesn't want you to just know about Jesus Christ. He wants you to become like Jesus Christ. This has been God's plan for you since the very beginning of time. Romans 8, 29 says this. From the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him, and all along he knew who would, should become like his son. God wants you to become like Jesus. You were created to become like Christ. How does that happen? Well, that's what we're going to talk about in this session. But let me be very clear right at the start. God is not saying that you're going to become a God. No, uh, God never says in the Bible that you'll be a God. Uh, you're not a God. You're not even a mini God. If you were a God, you could solve all your problems. Uh, a lot of new age people talk about becoming a God. You're not going to ever be a God. But God does want you to become godly. He wants you to develop Christ-like character, to see things the way Jesus does, to learn to think and to act and to speak and to love and to serve and to share, just like Jesus. He wants you to be like Jesus in every area of your life. The Bible says it like this, God wants us to grow up like Christ in everything, Ephesians 4.15. Spiritual growth is a lifelong process, just like physical growth. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes all of your life to grow up to maturity. So how does God do it? How does he grow us up to be like Christ? If this is the third purpose for putting us on this planet, how does he do it? Well, we know that God uses the Bible to help us grow because the Bible is our spiritual food and it's truth. The Bible calls itself water. It causes, calls itself the milk, the bread, the honey, and the meat of the spiritual life. Without a steady diet of the Word of God, you're going to starve yourself and you're going to stunt your own growth. You can't learn to think like Jesus if you don't know how Jesus thinks. You can't learn to love like Jesus if you don't know how Jesus loves. You can't learn to serve like Jesus if you don't know how Jesus serves. So God uses this book, the Bible, to develop the character of Christ in all of us. But God also uses more than the Bible. He uses people. He uses people to help us grow. That's what fellowship is all about. And we talked about that in the last session. But today, I want us to talk about three tools that God uses to help us grow that might not be so obvious to you. And at face values, when I mention these three things, they seem bad. And when we hear, hear these things, we think, well, how in the world could God use these to make me more like Christ? But we need to remember what the Bible says. Romans 8, 28, the verse before the one I just read, it says this, in all things, notice, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Those who have been called according to his purpose. God says, I'm going to use everything that happens in your life for the purpose that I have prepared you for to make you like Christ. God doesn't necessarily cause all things. In fact, he doesn't have to. A lot of things happen in my life because I cause them or other people cause them. But God works in all things to develop our character. Now, notice that the verse says, in all things. Does that mean painful things? Yes. Does it mean bad things? Yes. Does it mean evil things, stupid mistakes I make? Yes, yes, and yes. Does it mean the way other people hurt me? Yes. My own sins? Yes. It doesn't matter what it is, where it comes from, or who is the source. God says, in all things, I'm working for your good because you love me. It's a promise to those who've placed their lives in the hands of Christ. So I want you to write this down in your notes. First of all, God uses trouble to teach us to trust him. God uses trouble to teach us to trust him. Now, in the Bible, our troubles are called uh, lots of different things. They're called trials. 
tribulations, difficulties. Trials are situations designed by God to draw us closer to him. They're not meant to hurt us. They're meant to help us by stretching our faith and growing our character. The Bible says problems and trials are good for us. They help us learn to be patient. And patience develops strength of character in us and helps us trust God more each time we use it until finally our hope and our faith are strong and steady. Now get this. God is far more interested in what you are than in what you do. Why? Because you're not taking your career to heaven, but you are taking your character. All kinds of problems are going to come into your life. Troubles, trials, difficulties, tribulations. And you're going to say, why me, Lord? Why is this happening to me? As if your life is supposed to be a life of comfort. Well, it's not. This is not heaven, folks. This is earth. The goal of life on earth is not comfort. It's character. We're developing character in preparation for the next life. Now, character is developed through hardship, through trials, through trouble. I want you to write this down uh, in your study guide. Every problem has a purpose. Every problem has a purpose. I don't care whether you caused it or the devil caused it or somebody else caused it. Every problem has a purpose. And what is that purpose? It's the third purpose God has for your life, to make you like Jesus Christ to build character in your life. You were created to become like Christ. And God uses all those circumstances for that purpose. You know, Jesus went through many different trials and troubles in his life, but his greatest trouble was actually the night before he was crucified. He knew he was going to face the cross the very next day. He knew he was not going to only suffer the, the, the painful death, but he was going to take the sin of the world upon him. He was going to die a horrible death by crucifixion, but he was also going to take the guilt of you and me. So he takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and notice this. Even Jesus needed friends when he went through trouble. He took his disciples with him to pray. Even Jesus needed friends. That's why you need a small group when you're going through trials. That's why you need a fellowship. Nobody's supposed to go through all the troubles of life alone. Even Jesus needed his small group. Jesus said, the sorrow of my heart is so great that it almost crushes me in Mark chapter 14. Have you ever known that kind of pressure? Now notice how Jesus responds to trouble. Mark 14, 36, he says this, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will, not mine. Wow. Now, friends, if you're going to become like Jesus, you're going to have to learn this lesson. God is going to take you through Gethsemane. He's going to allow you to go through trouble. But when you go through that trouble, it's okay to say, God, God, I don't like this. God, I don't like it at all. I want you to take it away. It's okay to tell God exactly how you feel. But if you're going to become like Jesus Christ, you're going to have to learn to trust God completely, even when things look terrible, when life is falling apart, and you're saying, I don't understand that. I'm dying here. I'm sinking. I just can't take it anymore. When Jesus was facing his darkest hour, he said, Father, I know everything is possible with you. Nevertheless, your will be done in my life. And Jesus surrendered to God's plan. He, he's teaching us a model. He's teaching you and me to trust God in the Gethsemanes of life, the troubles of life, where we feel like we're going under for the last time. Now remember this. In eternity... God is going to reward you for your troubles. The Bible says, Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. The reward is greater than the pain, and you will be rewarded one day. God says that what you're going through right now isn't going to last. 
even if it lasted a lifetime. That's nothing compared to the billions and trillions of years you're going to spend in eternity. So really, it's short in comparison. God says, what you're going through now is light and temporary, but you're going to be rewarded for your character in heaven forever and ever and ever. God uses trouble to teach us to trust him. Now, here's a second tool God uses to help us become like Christ. God uses temptation to teach us to obey him. Yep, even temptation God uses for good in your life. God doesn't cause temptation. In fact, the Bible says God never tempts us to do evil. God cannot tempt, the Bible says. The Bible's very clear about that. But God can even use our temptations to make us more like Jesus if we cooperate with him. Why? Because every temptation involves a choice. We can choose to do evil or we can choose to do good. We can choose to disobey or we can choose to obey. Every time we obey God, we take another step in spiritual growth. Temptation is always a choice. And the choice is not just to do wrong. It is a choice to do right. And every time you choose to do right, our character grows. We are shaped by our choices. Now, this is very important to understand. The difference between trials and temptations. God uses them both, but they're very different. Remember, trials are situations designed by God to draw us closer to him. But temptations are situations designed by the devil to draw us away from God. We go through both. We're all tempted and we all go through trials. But you're never going to reach a point in your spiritual life where you're not tempted. Why? Because Jesus was the most mature person who ever lived, and even he was tempted. The Bible says Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Now, if Jesus faced temptations, guess what? You and I are going to face temptations in our deserts too. But here are some important things you need to remember about temptation. First, it's not a sin to be tempted. The Bible says Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, but he did not sin. Temptation and sin are two different things. The sin is how you respond to temptation. I like the way Martin Luther said it. He said, you know, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. <laughs> it's not a sin to be tempted. The second thing I want you to remember is that when you're tempted, uh, everybody is tempted the same way. The Bible says the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Now, Satan is going to try to make you feel like you're the only person who's ever been tempted in, in this certain way. And that if anybody ever found out about your temptation, they would think that you're some kind of evil monster or some weirdo. Truth is, everybody's tempted in the exact same ways. Power, lust, greed, selfishness, pride, revenge. There's really nothing new under the sun. Temptation is always a test of our love for God. What do I love most? Money or God? Power or God? Pleasure or God? Sex or God? Comfort or God? Reputation or God? It's all about who you love the most. Remember, temptations are situations designed by Satan to draw you away from God. But Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Now, here's the third thing you need to remember when you're being tempted. It's the last half of that verse we just read in 1 Corinthians. It says this, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, second half. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure it. Isn't that good news? So when you hear people say, you know, I just couldn't help myself. I, the temptation was too strong for me. It's not true. It's a lie. It simply isn't true. The Bible says God will never put more on you than he puts in you to bear it up. If you're following Christ, God will give you the strength to endure it. See, ultimately, it all comes down to your choice. Will I choose to obey the temptation or will I choose to obey God? Every time you choose to obey God, you become more and more like Christ in your character. And that's the third purpose of life. So 
Let's review. God uses trouble to teach me to trust him. And God uses temptation. He doesn't plan them, but he uses them to teach me to obey him. There's a third thing that God uses to make, like, make us like Christ, and you probably haven't ever thought of this one. God uses trespasses to teach us to forgive. God uses trespasses to teach us to forgive. What, what are trespasses? Well, uh, if, if trials are designed by God to draw us closer and temptation are designed by Satan to draw us away from God, trespasses are situations designed by other people to hurt us. Yeah, we live in a broken world. And because we live in a broken world, people in life are going to want to hurt you, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. That's why Jesus taught us to pray. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. That's in the Lord's Prayer. Now, let's admit it. Sometimes this is the hardest one to handle of all. It's one thing to handle trouble. It's another thing to handle temptation. But being hurt by other people without retaliating is just without a doubt the most imp important and most difficult step in becoming like Jesus Christ. You say, why? Because it involves being misunderstood. It involves being criticized, being judged, being hurt physically or emotionally or verbally. It may even involve being abused. And that hurts. Now, let me be perfectly clear here. These things that I just mentioned are not good things. They are evil. They are bad. They are wrong. And God is not the author of evil. And God does not cause these things. God hates evil. God hates sin. He grieves when he sees sin take place. He weeps over it. But God did not even protect his own son from these things. Even Jesus was misunderstood and hurt, and judged, and yes, even abused physically. You can see on the cross, Jesus Christ not only carried our sins, he endured enormous abuse from the people who put him there. The Bible says this, the people passing by, in other words, those looking at Jesus on the cross, shook their heads and hurled insults at Jesus, and the elders made fun of him. And even the bandits who had been crucified with him insulted him in the same way. So there's emotional abuse going on as well as physical abuse when Jesus is on the cross. What is Jesus' response to all of this? Well, here's what it says in the next verse, Luke 23, 34. He replies, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you say that in the face of abuse? Can you say that in the face of, of criticism and rebuke and ridicule and harm? 1 Peter 2.23 says this, They called him every name in the book, and he said nothing back. He suffered in silence, content to let God set things right. What did Jesus do? What was his response to trespasses? He gave up his right to get even. And how do you do that? How do you learn to forgive? Well, you can't. You can't learn to forgive unless somebody hurts you. Now, do you see why this is so important? Forgiveness is one of the primary qualities of God. Forgiveness is godly. God is constantly forgiving you and me. So God wants us to learn forgiveness. And that's why he allows hurts in our life in order to make us like Jesus. Now again, this is one of the toughest lessons you're ever going to have to learn. So let me give you two little suggestions for when people harm you, whether it's intentional or unintentional. You might write these down. Number one, remember that God has forgiven you. The Bible says, forgive others just as God has forgiven you because of Christ, Ephesians 4.32. God is never going to ask you to forgive anybody else more than you've already been forgiven by him. Remember, God has forgiven you. Number two, remember this, God is in control. And when somebody else hurts you, even if they mean it for bad, God will use it for good in your life. In fact, 
That's the very thing Joseph said in the Bible when his brothers sold him into slavery. Think about that. How'd you like to be betrayed by your own family? Talk about a dysfunctional family. And yet God had a plan even in all of that dysfunction. Joseph is sold by his brothers into slavery, taken to Egypt, falsely accused of rape, thrown into prison. The first 40 years of Joseph's life were nothing but pain and heartache and betrayal. And he had no idea why things were going on, why things were going wrong in his life. Yet he trusted God the whole time. And he maintained a forgiving spirit. God knew exactly where Joseph was. God had Joseph exactly where he wanted to be, even when he was in prison. And when the moment was just right, God raised Joseph up out of that pain to be the second in command of the entire nation of Egypt, which was the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And because of Joseph's leadership, all of Egypt, and all of Joseph's family were saved from starvation when the famines came. You can read that whole story in Genesis chapter 37 to 47. It's an amazing story. When Joseph's brothers eventually came down to Egypt for food, they didn't realize who he was. And they had a face-to-face -face meeting with him, and they thought he was just some Egyptian official. But when Joseph revealed his identity to them, they were scared to death. They're afraid that he's now going to retaliate and kill them. But here's what Joseph said to his brothers. You meant to hurt me, but God turned your evil into good to save the lives of many people, which is being done. Joseph knew that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. This is a fundamental foundation of living a purpose-driven life. That God uses trouble to teach us to trust him. God, uh, uh, to trust him. God uses temptation to teach us to obey him. And God uses trespasses to teach us to forgive others. And he does all of these to make us like Christ. The Bible says in Romans 8, 17, we go through exactly what Christ goes through. And if we go through the hard times with him, then we will certainly be going through the good times with him. What a promise. It's all to create us in the Christ-like image that God wants us to be. I want us to bow our heads for prayer. Would you bow your head? I don't know what you're going through uh, right now as I have shared these words. But I do know how God wants you to respond regardless of what you're going through. He wants you to respond to that situation the way Jesus did. So I want you to pray this in your heart right now. Dear God, I don't want to stay stuck in spiritual maturity. I want to grow up to be like Christ. I don't want to be a baby anymore. I want to become what you made me to be. I was created to become like Christ, and I want to become like Jesus in the way I think, and the way I feel, and the way I act. If that means taking me through troubled times, so be it. Let your will be done in my life. I'm going to trust you. If that means going through a desert of temptation, please give me the strength to make the right choices. Becoming like Jesus means I have to endure hurts from other people. Please teach me to forgive others as much as you have forgiven me. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, we've finished another session, and I hope you're enjoying this journey as we go through What on Earth Am I Here For? Enjoy your discussion time, and I'll see you in our next session.